One day in November 1945, on the edge of the Kalahari Desert, a young man set out on a journey. His name was Suretsi Kama. He was heir to the chieftainship of a tribe of a hundred thousand people. His journey would take him to England, 6,000 miles away. Once there, he would study law, first at Oxford University and then London. His tribe wanted him to learn the white man's ways. Since the death of his father, 20 years before, the tribe had been ruled by his uncle. It had been agreed that the older man would give up the chieftainship when Suretsi returned. Goodbye, nephew. Study hard. Learn all what they had to teach you, and then come home and lead your people. happened to Suretsi when he got to England was to shake the tribe to its foundations. But much worse than that, it would cause him to become the victim of a secret conspiracy by the British government. Cabinet ministers would lie to the House of Commons to protect what they saw as vital national interests, and they would deliberately falsify the record to conceal the truth. What Suretsi did was to fall in love with a white English girl and marry her. Her story, too, has been secret until now. When Suretsi was being seen off by his uncle, somebody said to his uncle, what will you do if he comes back with an English wife? And he said, well, there isn't much we can do about it, but she won't be welcome. By the spring of 1947, Suretsi Kama was studying law in London. Life for black people in post-war Britain was often lonely and difficult. Racial discrimination was commonplace, and Suretsi, like many other black students from the British Empire, looked to church organisations for help in finding both accommodation and friends. Particularly helpful were the London Missionary Society, the LMS, who had close connections with the tribe back home in Africa. They arranged social functions where black students could meet young English people. Muriel Williams from South London used to attend these LMS parties. I went to this weekend missionary conference for young people in the London area. So after the conference, uh, some of us went back up to the hostel to meet uh, the African students, which of course was a pretty unusual thing to do, but very exciting. And so that's how I met Suretsi. Muriel had a younger sister called Ruth, who worked for an insurance company in the city. Both girls lived with their parents in South London. 
Like many young people emerging from the war, Ruth worked hard at enjoying herself. More fun-loving than Muriel, she filled her life with riding, ice skating and dancing to jazz. It's natural when one is in one's 20s to have boyfriends and Ruth certainly had her share of boyfriends and she was always, she was very attractive and uh, so there were many young men who were interested in her. <laughs> Muriel felt sure that Ruth would like Sir Etsy. She arranged for them both to meet. So this particular Saturday evening, Ruth came up and there was a whole big group of us and that's where she first met Sir Etsy. I remember the first moment I saw Sir Etsy. Um, I think the thing was we had both made up our minds that we were not going to get on. And uh, he had made up his mind. He had heard that I apparently was rather spoilt and he was not going to... Um, do any spoiling and I thought he was a very very uh, ungentlemanly bad-mannered person and also I felt that he was too spoiled because he was a chief. Despite such an unpromising start Soretzi was impressed. The next time they met the hostility between them evaporated. I think he telephoned a few days later and asked her to go out with him the following week. It wasn't something that happened in a hurry. It was, it was a very ga gradual thing. We used to uh, go out with a, a group of people from time to time to dinner or to, to um, a pub and have um, early evening drinks or something like that before dinner. And then into a cinema. And then gradually we would, we would go on our own Well, the colour thing didn't really come into it. It was the person I was with, not the colour. I actually wasn't with a black man, I was with a man I liked who happened to be black. I did not see anything wrong in the friendship at all. And this idea that because somebody has got more pigmentation in their skin, therefore they are not as superior as you are. Never been able to work that out either. I've often tried to think and analyse why it was that neither of us seemed to have any sense of racial feeling at all, because plenty of our friends did, and it was quite normal at that time. I think at that time, if you were seen in public with a black man or you went out with a black man, then of course you were a sort of a low type of person. People look, they turn around and they will stare, they will make sarcastic comments, this type of thing. So I very often, if Mira was in town, we used to meet up and used to go home by train. I can remember some appalling scenes at Charing Cross Station coming home. There certainly was an assumption that we were white trash and that any self-respecting white girl would not be seen with an African at all. And one particular evening, there were some people who were so objectionable that Sir Etsy had to come down with us because he thought we weren't going to be safe. He thought these people would attack us. Then he had to walk us all the way home as well. And then go back and then probably walk five or six miles, which was very trying, very unfair. He would occasionally be lucky and pick up an old taxi that was going that way or a bus that was going into the, the, the um, garage for the night. I suppose nigger was a pretty common word in those days, wasn't it? And, and whatever are these two white girls doing with that, with that nigger there? And uh, Ruth would turn to me and say, Muriel, do you hear what that man's saying over there? And this is supposed to be British civilised people. And I would join and say, yes, isn't it appalling? We're supposed to be setting people a good example and look at what, look at what they're doing. They don't know how to behave. They're the uncivilised ones. And we would sort of carry this on. Both girls were very close to their father, George Williams. He'd been an army officer and was now a businessman. They thought it better not to tell him of Ruth's growing romance. My father was just fairly typical of his generation. He had served as an officer in India during the First World War, and I think uh, he was fairly typical of many people in India at that time and didn't have a very high opinion of Indians. And uh, although 
in a contradictory way, he would tell us the most romantic stories about Indian princes, which was really very inconsistent. So on one hand, we, we, we gathered that Indians could be pretty inefficient, and on the other hand, we heard these lovely romantic tales about Indian princes, and I think it must have been rather confusing. I knew there was no point in my mentioning that I was seeing um, somebody who was not white. He would not have approved because he, he also had the, the same sort of color prejudice. He didn't think the races should mix. She felt that she had a right to do what she wanted to do without having to tell my father or ask him. And I can remember some of the breakfast conversations. She didn't really eat much breakfast most mornings, but sometimes we'd meet at the table and my father would say, oh, where did you go last night? Out. Oh, where's out? London. Where in London? Theatre. Who were you with? Friends. <laughs> that was all she would give away, no more. So in the end, he gave up asking questions. I don't think he had any idea. My mother knew, we told her. And so, of course, she was very worried about what was going to ultimately happen. But she was a brick. Her response was, I married who I wanted to, so my daughters can marry who they want to. And that was pretty advanced for those days. It didn't occur to me at that time that we would really get married. Soretsi then said to me one evening that uh, I would love you to come to Africa, that I wouldn't want you to come and then find that you couldn't stand the life and then want to come back. Because basically what I'm doing is I'm asking you to marry me. And I would really like nothing more than that. But I, one thing I'd never want in my life is a divorce. And it was left alone for about two weeks. And Serenzi said to me one evening, have you thought about what I have said about my proposal and about coming out to Africa and being my wife? But I didn't need to think about whether or not I loved him. Uh, that did not come into it at all. The biggest decision was on not making a mistake, and not disappointing Serenzi and myself. But at the same time, I felt I couldn't live without him either. And so finally I said, yes, um, I, 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 I would love to marry him and I would love to come out. Uh, there was nothing flippant about that decision at all. And uh, the next big decision we had to make was how and when to tell my father. And that night I will never forget. Mm. My idea of hell, I think, and Ruth's as well. What was really worrying me was the heartbreak that I knew my decision was going to give him. When I came in, my mother said she just took one look at my face and she said, oh my God, I know what's coming here. Because she knew that, that, that we were seeing each other. And uh, he, he just um, tried to persuade me to change my mind. He said, couldn't, couldn't I um, think a little bit first and couldn't I change my mind? Couldn't I, did I have to go ahead with it? And I said, yes, I did have to go ahead with it. Why did I have to go ahead with it? Because I couldn't live now without Soretsi. We were just, you know, just loved each other too much and we didn't want to live without each other. So I did have to go ahead with it. He really was shaken rigid. And he couldn't even stay in the house. He said to my mother, come on, let's go out. We're going for a drive. He came the next day when I just greeted him. He said, don't, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me again unless you change your mind. You can stay here until you get married. Once you get married, don't ever come back. Denied her home, Ruth was next denied her job. She worked for a firm of Lloyd's underwriters. Soon news of her engagement reached her boss. I had been asked to leave WAC when the um, underwriting firm that I was with had learnt that I was going to get married. And I was asked if this was the case and if the man I was marrying was black and I said yes. My boss tried very hard to dissuade me from getting married. Um, they then asked me to leave immediately, which I did. Soretsi too feared his family's reaction. On September the 12th, 1948, he wrote to his uncle. Dear uncle, I realize that this matter will not please you because the tribe will not like it as the person I am marrying 
is a white woman. I realized that it was my duty to have asked your consent before I had done this thing, but I know you would refuse. Please forgive me. The woman that I am marrying is having a very trying time at home. Please don't try to stop me as I want to go through with it. Your loving nephew, Seretsi. Seretsi's tribe was called the Bamangwato, and they lived a hard and impoverished life, sandwiched between the Kalahari Desert and white-ruled South Africa. In the days of Queen Victoria, the Bamangwato had put themselves under the protection of the British Crown to avoid being swallowed up by land-hungry whites. As a result, their land was called the British Protectorate of Bechuanaland. The British allowed the tribal chiefs to run the country and relied on them to maintain law and order. Ever since Seretsi's father had died, the tribe had been ruled by his uncle, Sekedi. I remember one of the traders saying to me, Sekedi doesn't want to be like a white man, he reckons he's as good as any four white men. And that's not too bad an estimate. I mean, he, he was proud of being, being an African, proud of being black and proud of being a Mungwatu. Sekedi administered the tribe from a building called the Red House. He was, by then, one of the most powerful black men in British Africa. Seretsi's letter reached him on September the 20th. Zena! For 20 years he'd ruled the tribe as regent, but was now expecting to hand over the chieftainship to his nephew as soon as the young man returned from England. <laughs> What Sekedi read in his nephew's letter seemed like a betrayal of himself, the tribe and its traditions. He got so angry, he didn't like it at all. So he thought that it was not a in keeping with our, with our tradition. And of course, even the tribesmen themselves, they believe that now Sereza was uh, had taken the wrong course by getting married to a white woman who would not be conversant with the people. I was very sad to hear about it. And I was also supporting Sekiri when he, he said he's refusing to allow him to marry the white women. We are black in colour. Our custom is not the, like the, the white people's. The objection would be the possibility that the next heir to the chieftainship could be a person of mixed race, a coloured person in, in South African parlance. And uh, generally speaking, both black and white tended to look down on the coloured people. That first thinking, you know, was that uh, the children of the marriage would be coloured. And at that time, you know, coloureds were not very popular people, you know, amongst us. I mean, they did not like that, uh, that idea because they didn't want to be led by coloured uh, chiefs and so on. Sekedi turned for help first to the London Missionary Society, whose church dominated the village. Mm -hmm. 
The London Missionary Society, the LMS, had converted the tribe to Christianity in the days of Suretz's grandfather. No other church was allowed into the territory and its influence over the Bamangwato was total. Chikede had virtually placed his nephew in the care of the LMS whilst that young fellow was in England. And consequently, he felt that the LMS was the right organization to act. If anyone could do anything, he felt the LMS could do it. They could pull the stops out. And of course, as far as he was concerned, the LMS was his church. Ronald Orchard, the LMS's Africa secretary, and A.J. Hale, its regional director for Southern Africa, contacted Dr. Roger Pilkington, a supporter of the LMS who had befriended Suretzi the year before. All three immediately made plans to stop the marriage. They responded because they regarded his position with respect as the leader of a very powerful tribe in which the church was paramount and consequently they felt that they must do all that they possibly could to respond to this request whether they agreed with it or not on the night of september the 24th Suretzi was in his west london flat preparing for his wedding the following day at midnight he heard a taxi draw up outside. Dr. Roger Pilkington had arrived to carry out Sakedi's wishes. Pilkington was to describe what happened next in a letter which he wrote to Sakedi two days later. On Friday evening, I finally managed to contact Zaretsi on the eve of his wedding. I arrived at his flat in Campton Hill. I told him he was behaving disgracefully. I told him it was cowardice to get married without having first faced up to the tribe. When I finally left his flat at 4.30 in the morning, I was sure he had accepted my arguments and was prepared to delay the wedding. Roger Pilkington couldn't have been more wrong. Muriel and I arrived at Sorenzi's flat. Sorenzi and I had, had a quick talk and he told me that Roger had been there the night before and he had told him that he wasn't going to change his mind and he said we should just keep to that, which we did. The wedding was arranged for St George's Church, close to Sorenzi's flat. To ensure the ceremony was off, Pilkington took the others to see the vicar. That morning, they'd learnt the British High Commissioner in South Africa, Sir Evelyn Baring, had cabled the government. Most grateful for any help you can give us. Marriage would be disastrous for Bamangwato tribe and Soretsi personally. Able now to invoke British government concern, the trio entered the vicarage. The vicar, Dr Leonard Patterson, soon wilted before their attack. Anarchy and disorder would ensue in southern Africa, they told him, if the wedding went ahead. He should telephone the couple, they said, and tell them the ceremony was off. We were getting ready when the telephone went. Sirity went to answer it. And it was Mr. Patterson to say that he would not be able to marry us because he did not want to embarrass us. The LMS people had been to see him and they told him that if he continued with the service when it got to that time in the service when he asks if anybody knows any, etc, etc. They were going to stand up and say yes, they did. He was all at sixes and sevens. He 
obviously didn't know what he should do, but he said that if we were to see the Bishop of London, who was given this induction ceremony at St. Mary Abbott's, and with his approval, then he would go ahead and, as he put it, tie the knot. So we went off to St. Mary Abbott's, where we sat through a three-hour ceremony in order to see the uh, Bishop of London. As Ruth and Soretzi waited inside the church, Pilkington and the others discovered where they'd gone. Setting off in pursuit, they arrived at the same time as the Bishop of London and quickly persuaded him that the wedding should be cancelled. When Ruth and Soretzi finally spoke to the Bishop, his mind was already made up. He was a very, very cold, unfeeling man. He had no sympathy whatsoever. And he obviously wasn't going to do anything uh, about giving permission for us to get married in church. I then, in desperation, and I think in a certain amount of anger, said to the bishop, are you encouraging me to live in sin, seeing that I have left home? And he said, that will be your decision, if that is what you want to do. Which, of course, I did not do. So I moved into a hotel in Bayswater Road. I think she was in a daze. Uh, she was in a state of shock as well. But you see, Soretzi was a law student and he knew the law very well indeed. And he knew that there was no legal reason why they should not get married. And so he assured her that there would be no problem. He would go and get a special license and they could be married that week anyway. Soretzi then thought the best thing for us to do would be to give the impression that we were going to do a rethink on the whole thing. And on the Monday morning, he went off to get a special license for us to get married on Wednesday morning. And during those three days before the Wednesday, we spent days out of London so that we should lie low and people wouldn't be aware of us. And if they came to see us, we wouldn't be around. So every day we went to a different place, one of those being Brighton. And we walked on the, on the beach, which was really rather refreshing. We just kept our fingers crossed that it all would go well on Wednesday. Nobody would find us and nobody would stop the wedding. We used to come back late in the evening and just keep out of the way. On Monday the 27th, the bishop assured the LMS that everything was in safe hands. I am very grateful for your communication. I saw Dr. Patterson and I write to let you know that the matter is now being dealt with by the Colonial Office. The LMS's Reverend Orchard replied, I am sure the Colonial and Commonwealth offices can best deal with the matter, and I am glad it has been referred to them. In the meantime, we must give what help we can of a pastoral kind to those concerned. Faithfully yours, R.K. Orchard. The London Missionary Society's job was done. The problem of how to stop the marriage had now become a matter for the British government.
Ruth and Soretsi were lying low outside London. The British government were unaware of their plans for a register office wedding in three days' time and had started searching for ways to stop the marriage ever happening. One civil servant in Whitehall suggested that all register offices should be circulated with the false rumour that Soretsi was already married. While this was being considered, civil servants in the colonial office were searching the files for some reason to declare the marriage illegal. They decided to see whether there were any examples of marriages between colonial and British citizens in one part of the empire being declared invalid in another. Although the researchers persisted for three days, all they could come up with was the case of a tea planter from Ceylon who'd had trouble getting his marriage recognised in Scotland. Apparently, there had been problems too for a group of Honduran foresters on contract work in the Highlands. Arthur Bottomley, a junior government minister who'd been to Bechuanaland the previous year, was then asked to intervene. And the Foreign and Commonwealth Office got in touch with me and I said, no, I didn't know him well enough to intervene. I think law and order was an important factor and uh, the Commonwealth Office was very keen that uh, Shikadi should carry on for a while. After all, he was a very powerful figure and a very able person. On Wednesday, September the 29th, Ruth and Soretsi came out of hiding and arrived at Kensington Register Office with their special licence. On that Wednesday morning, I think ours was the first service there. We met about quarter to nine and went there and we sat and sat and sat what seemed like an eternity and we thought, well, somebody now has managed to stop this one as well. Why are they taking so long? Mr. Carver, may I see you for a moment, please? He had put his father was native chief or something, and something that they, they did not understand what, what that meant. So they wanted it clarified. And that was the reason for the long, long, long delay where we were beginning to think somebody now had come and managed to persuade them not to marry us. In Saroe, news of the marriage provoked angry disapproval, particularly among the tribal elders. Mm. To a man, they supported Sakedi's opposition to the marriage. <laughs> No, all his uh, great advisors were called to Sirowe to be informed about the Sarese's marriage. And all the time he was uh, expressing his uh, ill feeling about the uh, Sarese's uh, marriage and so on, you see. At first, you know, because he was a very convincing man, people tended to, uh, to agree with him. They believed him and they thought that Sarese had done the wrong thing by marrying, getting married to, to a white uh, uh, lady. I, I remember being asked by one person, was Soretsi, was it Princess Margaret that Soretsi had married? Well, uh, I suppose to us that sounds an odd, odd thing for somebody to think. But it does illustrate the fact that to them, Soretsi was royalty. And royalty should marry royalty. But as Soretsi waited in London, 
reports soon began reaching him that the tribe's opposition was not as total as it first appeared. It gradually became clear that uh, people were changing their attitude. The basic reason, I think, was the intense loyalty that there is to the chief among uh, people like the Bahamangwato. Uh, it's a loyalty that has almost a religious uh, aura to it. Um, the, the chief is, is there because God wants him to be there. And uh, I, I, think, I think it was that realisation that uh, started the, the move. Yes, during the time when we had that, that, that trouble, there used to be a, a lot of meetings, you know, going on at night. And uh, it was mostly uh, Sekedi and his men, you know, who used to call meetings at night. Sensing the tribe was changing its mind, Sekedi tried to rally support. <laughs> it was uh, during the meetings that uh, the people started to uh, uh, suspect that there was something going on. The tribesmen now began to suspect that Sekedi was trying to use the marriage to keep the chieftainship for himself. They suspect that maybe that Sekedi wanted to accept chieftainship from Serese, you see. And so they decided now that Serese was the, the lawful uh, heir apparent, you see, to, to the Bamangato chieftainship. So they decided now, I think they decided to, to support Serese. In June 1949, Seretsi left Ruth in London and flew home to confront his uncle. His aircraft flew due south on the first leg of his 6,000-mile journey to southern Africa. At Johannesburg, he caught a train to take him to the Bechuanaland Protectorate, crossing the border at Mafeking and arriving at Soroe on the morning of June the 15th. His return immediately won thousands to his cause. I changed my mind really because I was so my chief is among us. He's re, he was returned from England. That is why I changed my mind. When I saw his eyes, I realized he was the true chief of the Bamamato. On the 20th of June, the Bamangwato gathered in Soroe to settle the question of the marriage and the leadership of the tribe. For hundreds of years, the tribe had settled its problems in traditional public gatherings like this, called kotla meetings. Today, as then, tribesmen may stand up and speak for as long as they wish, and all must listen. Forty years ago, the Bamangwato assembled in their thousands to decide whether to allow Seretsi, with his white wife, to rule them. The meeting would last for four days, and it began with Seretsi leaving no one in any doubt about what was at stake. I am here to await the decision of the Bamangwato. If you refuse me, I will go. If you accept me, I will bring my wife here. It has been suggested that I should keep my wife overseas. 
or that I should leave her. I will never leave her. You must have us both or refuse us both. For two days, the debate swung back and forth, no one daring to voice the growing belief that Sekedi was trying to use the marriage as an excuse for his own personal ambitions. Few people now seem to accept his argument that a mixed marriage would split the tribe. Eventually, one man, Hualetsa Sukuru, plucked up courage to say what many others were thinking. <laughs> As the tribe muttered its approval of what had been said, Sakedi stood up to defend himself. I have never denied that Suraj is a rightful heir. I object to this marriage with a white woman for the sake of the tribe, not for my sake. If the woman comes here, it will split the tribe in two. The house of Hama is Suraj's house. I want Suraj to have children who will become black chiefs, not white ones. I had wanted to give him the chieftainship peacefully, properly, without disturbance. But the game was lost. Sensing his moment, Seretsi stepped forward. Now, I ask those who say, let the white woman come to stand. I think 90% of the people in the court I know stood up and then it was uh, nothing but a lot of noise and pull up, pull and so on, you see. Everybody was standing up and cheering and uh, shouting a pula, which of course is the uh, Sichuan way of cheering. The best assessment of the vote that day was that 4,000 stood for Suretsi, only 40 for his uncle. Six thousand miles away, Ruth waited in the couple's new flat in North London. The days were passing slowly. She'd had no news from Soretzi since he'd left. Then, on June the 25th, a telegram arrived. It was from Soretsi. It read, Tribe accepts us both. It was a tremendous relief to think that maybe now our many separations would come to an end and we could start a proper married life because we had not had too much time together during this year. And I suppose it was thought now that one could join him and we could start uh, setting up home together, which was a great relief. And also, the relief was that this was going to be a tremendous thing for him. His people had accepted the whole situation. He would be there, which is where he wanted to be, and he could give so much to them. The, the opposition to, to the marriage had begun in the tribe. Uh, and it was therefore the duty of the protecting power, which of course was the British government, uh, once that opposition was removed, uh, to act accordingly. Although of course it is true that the law of the protectorate did give the government the right to withhold recognition, but as far as I could see there was no, no special reason why that recognition should be withheld. Well, we thought that the problem was over because, you see, he was even tipped by one of the government officials that uh, the High Commissioner might call him to Pretoria you know, to confirm that uh, he was going to take over as, as chief of the Bamangwatu. So we, we thought it was over.
In Siroe, the celebrations went on for days. For nearly a year, the tribe had lived with argument and dissent as opinion had swung back and forth. Now, by an overwhelming majority, the matter was settled once and for all. Soon, the tribe believed, Ruth would fly out to join their new chief and life could settle down as normal. After all the upheaval, the Bamangwato hoped that their troubles were finally over. They were not to know that they were just beginning. At 10 a.m. on Thursday, the 30th of June, 1949, a chauffeur-driven car drew up outside South Africa House in Trafalgar Square. It had come to collect Leif Egerland, the South African High Commissioner to Britain. In Mr. Egerland's briefcase was an urgent message from the South African Prime Minister in Pretoria. The message was the result of a South African cabinet meeting the previous day and Mr. Egerland had been instructed to deliver it to a senior British cabinet minister immediately. The South African government was appalled that the British seemed about to confirm as tribal chief a man who'd not only married a white woman, but was now going to live with her on their very borders. Mr. Egerland's duty was to leave the British government in no doubt about Pretoria's feelings. The meeting was scheduled for 10.15 and the High Commissioner's car arrived in good time. I have been instructed by my Prime Minister to represent urgently the grave concern which my government feels about the possible installation of Seretsi Kama as Chief of the Bamanguato. The implications of recognising such a man married as he is to a white woman, are extremely serious. South Africa regards the marriage as an infringement of a basic principle. As far as the woman is concerned, I would wager she won't last six months. For 40 years, the British government has denied that this meeting ever took place. Government documents, however, including a British minister's personal memorandum of the conversation, prove that it did. The meeting was to be but the first move in South Africa's determination to rid herself of Ruth and Seretsi Kama. Other documents, secret until now under government restrictions, prove that ministers believed the Seretsi affair threatened some of Britain's most vital interests. To placate South Africa, a campaign of lies and trickery was devised with Ruth and Seretsi as the victims. While the pressure was being applied, Fleet Street decided the tribe's decision was front-page news. The idea of a white tribal queen captured the popular imagination. As Ruth waited impatiently for permission to join her husband, the newspaper men arrived in force. You were continually being frightened by people appearing on the right or the left or behind you or jumping out of a door or something like that. And it was, it was really quite a nervous time. They were just, ne you were ne never without them. In Siroe, Suretsi too was impatient for Ruth to join him. In the first days after the tribe's decision, British officials had told him that his confirmation as chief was only a formality. But now from London, there was only silence. Unknown to the young couple, they had set in motion a chain of events which would not only threaten their happiness, but embroil the British government in a secret conspiracy that it hoped would never see the light of day.
On an August morning in 1949, a young Englishwoman was moving out of her North London flat. She was on her way to join her husband, 6,000 miles away. But first, she would have to get through the newspaper men camped on her doorstep, for this woman was front page news. Less than a year before, Ruth Karma had married a black African tribal chief. Now Fleet Street was agog. The fascination was that Sereti was a chief, and I suppose also the fascination was they wanted to see what sort of a white girl was going to marry a black man. Her husband, Saretsi Kama, lived in Bechuanaland, a British territory of desert and scrubland with South Africa as its neighbour. Three years before, he'd left his people to journey to England to finish his education. He would then, it was planned, return as chief. But once there, he'd met Ruth Williams, the 24-year-old daughter of a London businessman, and they'd fallen in love. When they decided to marry, they faced opposition on every side. Ruth's father disowned her and banned her from the family home, and Soretz's tribe disinherited him, objecting to the idea of a white queen and mixed-race children. The tribe's opposition had been led by Soretz's uncle, and he used his contacts with the British government and the Church of England to stop the marriage less than an hour before it was due to take place. Three days later, Ruth and Soretzi were secretly married at a register office. In the months that followed, the tribe gradually changed its mind, turning against Soretzi's uncle and accepting the young man as their chief and his white bride as their queen. Now at last, Soretzi could send for Ruth. Now they could start their life together. But as Ruth flew out, powerful forces were already gathering, ensuring that their happiness would soon be over. Ruth 
Ruth was reunited with her husband on August the 20th, 1949. 40 years later, she still remembers the warmth of the tribe's welcome. It was extremely exciting. It was really marvelous. And the welcome that I received from the people was fantastic. And it was really genuine. They were really delighted to see us both together there. And they showed it in many, many ways. They were ululating and dancing around the car every time we stopped. All this sort of thing followed us wherever we went. It was tremendous. My impression was that she was a really very uh, good-looking lady and nice and honest, you know, open-minded uh, young lady. Because she was still young then, you see. But uh, I liked her very much, you know, by the time when we traveled together from Francis down to Seroe, I had already got used to him so much so that I could uh, say anything to her, you know, play with her and so on, joke with her and so on, you see. As I came into Seroe, it just was exactly the same as Seroe had described it. Seroe, the capital of the Balanguato territory in northern Bekuana land, is very much in the news. To this native town, Seretse Kama, seen here, has brought his English bride, Ruth Williams, traveling 200 miles through the bush from the nearest airport. This will be Ruth's first glimpse of her future domain. The British press felt sure that Ruth would never settle down in Saroe. What will Ruth Kama, the former London typist, think of all this? And what do the fine old native types think about having a white queen, I wonder? There's been a lot of controversy, of course, and some friction. Saretze's new saloon car whisks through the high street and his wife, who had made a secret flight from London to join him, has her first sight of the home beyond the village which he has prepared for it. It stands alone in the felt, and workmen are still busy on the western-style house. A barricade of thorn trees is being thrown up as a protection against marauding lions. But all the times. Under my tender loving care. I really just felt that I had arrived home. We um, believed that we had overcome all the problems we were now settling, making a home, and there was no need to look back. Everything was now resolved. I didn't think there was going to be any trouble from the British at that stage. Not at all. There was no point. I mean, after all, it was supposed to be up to the tribe, and it was the tribe's decision. If they said the tribe should choose, then why should there be any opposition from them? If, there was, if they didn't approve, then why go through the whole thing of letting the, the tribe choose? But the wishes of the tribe, like those of Ruth and Seretsi, were soon to be swept aside. Great forces were at work in southern Africa, and just across the border, fundamental change was underway. In Pretoria, a new government, with a new attitude to black and white, was taking power. The National Party swept into office in 1948. Its pledge to the white electorate was to protect white racial purity, entrench white power, and subjugate blacks. Anti-British to a man, the new Prime Minister, Dr. Daniel Malan, and his cabinet assumed office with a new political philosophy, apartheid, which demanded the division of society by race and ensured...